Um, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, this morning, we're going to change focus a little bit, as Prashant said, um, from a lot of the discussions about international response mechanisms and ways of bringing um, in money from the international community um, to the realities of what happens in country. Um, and here to um, help discuss um, this um, topic, um, I have four people. Um, James Coley on my immediate right, who's the Deputy Minister for Financial Affairs in, in Liberia. Um, immediately to the right of him, Gordon Liu, Professor of Economics at Beijing University. Um, to his right, Victor Bampo, the Deputy Minister of Health from Ghana. And on the end, last but not least, Tendabiti, former Minister of Finance from um, Zimbabwe. I'd like to start, if I can, and I will follow the format used um, before I'll ask each of the panelists a couple of questions, and then we'll open up for broader discussion. Um, if I can start with you, James. Um, <laughs> you're, you're the minister in charge of um, fiscal affairs. Um, during the Ebola outbreak, you had a simultaneous decline in revenues and um, uh, increase in, um, uh, in expenses, uh, a challenge for anybody in a finance ministry. C can you discuss how you responded to that and how relief financing might have helped mitigate um, that challenge? Okay. Good morning, and uh, th thank you, Peter. It's, uh, it's an honor to be to be here and to participate in these uh, in these conversations. You, you are exactly right. D during the crisis, we had a twin problem: so revenue is decreasing at the same time. There is an exponential increase in expenditure demand, and I believe for for obvious reasons, it's easy to understand how expenditure demand will be increasing in such a crisis especially for countries like, like ours in which most of the, the equipment, the, the, the facility, and, then, and the gears that you needed to fight such, such a, uh, an epidemic weren't available in countries. It means then that you had to, to bring them in. Additionally, you can understand the, the, the increased expenses around personnel in terms of hazard pay for health workers, moving them to, to hot spots, and for security agencies in terms of trying to, to enforce some of the public health rules. And so expenditure demand uh, naturally will increase. On the other hand, with revenue, it's a little bit complicated because then, in our, in our case, it's, it's a country that is more enclaved. It's a country in, in which uh, what, before the crisis came, we started experiencing a, a drop in revenue because of the way the economy is structured. It's, it, it's primary commodities, iron ore and rubber started experiencing declining prices on the world market. And so you can see how then the Ebola crisis that, that, that made uh, the multinationals to begin to evacuate, that mass exodus of them slowing down on their projects, coupled with the, the declining prices were more like a perfect storm, and so revenue started to, to slide down. In the initial stage of the crisis, you will see then that that max exodus of expatriates would then affect the service, uh, the service sector in, in a significant way because then hotel occupancy started to, how to call it, to drop. There were some cases in which uh, those who ran hotels would tell us, the look, you know, I have only one person in my hotel. I would prefer if they left so I can close down. And so then when ho hotel occupancy is dropping, you will see restaurants and other things start to, to go down. Those who are doing construction in the service area will stop because it's a, it's, it's a crisis. And so on, on, on the revenue side, it's a little bit complicated. So even though the crisis contributed to it, there were other structural issues in the economy that then made it difficult. It depends on how the revenue stream is structured. And in, in that instance, it's, 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 it's more than just a, a relief financing. This is where we're trying to enlist uh, donors or development partners to begin to work with these countries so that we're able to diversify our economies. What that means is that investing in key economic infrastructure, for example, power, all our ports and our road infrastructure, so we're able to increase access to services, we're able to reduce uh, transportation costs, those kinds of things will need to happen before this crisis. So it's, it's a structure of the economy that can then reduce the impact of revenue decline. Now, on the, on the expenditure side, it's, it's, it's important for three things to happen with relief financing in this crisis. One, they'll have to be timely or quick. 
It's, it's important for that to happen if donors are going to come in. And maybe that's where it makes sense for, for this, uh, the, the, this emergency fund to be set up, whether it's at country level or at international level, before these crises. Because in my opinion, it's late when we're having a pledging conference for an ongoing epidemic. It's already late. This pledging conference should be used to replenish the emergency, the emergency fund. But these funds will have to be available to be able to respond I'll call it almost immediately. And then you can have ongoing pledging conference to, to replenish. The funds also have to be targeted. It means that when donuts come in or relief financing come in, they will first have to, to coordinate and seek to fill the gaps, those things that are lacking. It, it, it doesn't benefit anybody for all of the donors to crowd out in one place and leave other things undone. So it's important for us to be targeted, to look at what's lacking in that particular, in the, in that particular situation and be able to respond. And then I also think that the, the relief financing has to be strategic. Because you see the crisis has a circle. It starts, it peaks, stabilizes, and then we start to see it. At different stages, the financing has, has to, at, at a certain point when we peak or we start to go down, we then have to start looking beyond the crisis. And our interventions will have to be strategic in terms of I mean, the lessons learned in terms of how do we position that particular health system to be able to deal with either a reoccurrence or some other emergency in, in, the, in the future. For example, at that certain stage in our, in our crisis, when, when we start to build, for example, treatment units in isolated areas that can or will never be used after the crisis is over, that is a challenge. We may want to begin to append these treatment units to existing health facilities. So after the crisis, we're able to use them for other reasons. And if there's an emergency, they can still be used as a solution facility. So the crisis presents an opportunity, and we have to be able to use it strategically. The, the, the fact is that we're not able, during the crisis, to mitigate most of the impact. It means that we have to take interventions before the crisis. In our case, the health system is extremely weak. I mean, I don't care what you do during the crisis, the, the impact is going to be as large as it is. But if we, take, if we take decisions or take actions before the crisis, these interventions need to come in building these resilient systems and making sure that they're able. Our country, there was not a single, not a single PPE in country. Our health workers did not even know how to use PPE. That, that is a problem. And so then you will see the health system came to a virtual shutdown. You're not able to fix that during the crisis. It's good that in, in the preparedness stage, the, most of these systems will have, to be, will have to be tested and make sure that they're able at least minimally to respond to these kinds of things so that we don't have folks dying from diabetes and malaria even though we're fighting Ebola, which was the case because the system was, was, was vulnerable, it was, it was fragile, and it was susceptible to, to, to everything we saw. So it's a lesson for us to start to prepare these, uh, these systems. Thank you, James. You, you talked about the sort of differing needs, financial needs at different phases of the crisis, preparedness, acute, and then you're now in the phase of navigating the recovery of Liberia and Liberia's economy. Can you talk a little bit more about what the financial needs are now and what the financial challenges are that you face as a ministry um, in this phase after the most acute phase? Exactly. Like I said, the, 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 the crisis didn't bring about out of the problem. It highlighted the problems. It highlighted the vulnerabilities in the system. And so our job now is to begin. And, and health, it, it was a health crisis. But what else could happen? Our entire social, de uh, social service delivery system, our educational system, our banking, our banking system, all of these systems, in our opinion, needs to be stress tests and, and see what can be done to fix them, to make them more, more resilient. That's the bus one, and building a resilient health system. We need to be able to do that. But we also need to do that in, in, in education and other service delivery, service delivery system. So that's where the... The, the, the investment needs to be made, and we're enlisting our partners to be able to do that. But also in the, in the larger economy, we need to be able now to, to, uh, to diversify our economy. We need to be able to make the, the key investment so that we're able to, to expand the economy, we're able to diversify our revenue streams, because these crises, not if they come, they will come. 
and this how prepared we're going to be for them to minimize the impact. These shocks will definitely create some, some impact. It's how we minimize them. So the, the, the focus now is on making sure we bring cheap and affordable power online to be able to, to do light manufacturing value addition and then to be able to even improve service delivery because power is going to be key. I mean, one of the, 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 uh, the speakers talked yesterday. I mean, if, if there's no electricity in the hospital, how do you run the hospital? The hospital is probably going to shut down during the night because there's no power. We need to have cheap power online. We need to focus on our ports, both our sea and our airport. Those are 1950 infrastructures. They cannot serve today's how to call it, economy. How do we then have access to market and open the economy if we don't invest in our port? And so we're doing that, both our airport and our seaport. Th those are the areas we're thinking about. And obviously, our roads. You can build a hospital if folks cannot access the hospital. Even the cases where uh, we needed to pick up infected people and take them to treatment center, the roads are bad. So even the ambulances will have a challenge. And if there's no access, there's no way that people can, can get uh, the services they, they need. So, and, and additionally, to be able to, to, to reduce transportation, transportation costs and, and expand the economy. So those are the key areas on those key economic infrastructures of power, or ports, and our roads. We're making investment there. And we're also trying to make investment in building our social service delivery system, including health, so that they're more resilient and more prepared to be able to reduce the, the impact of such a crisis.